Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a brief background. Uh, Boston Consulting Group now has an analytics um, practice that's homegrown, and we also have our own product company inside of, of Gamma, which is building its own proprietary analytics platform, which is actually not a platform, it's an analytics engine that's supposed to um, be something a la AWS SageMaker, if you guys have seen that, just a little better and obviously not bound to AWS. Um, so we have an R&D team and an engineering team right now, um, and we're also part of BCG Digital Ventures, which if you guys don't know, is the venture arm of BCG, which actually has worked with multiple companies and released brand new companies. One of them is TACT, which is Starbucks' new personalization company that's just been funded uh, on Seed B. So we're really deep into implementing what we uh, strategize on. And so today I'm going to speak a little bit about a lot of our clients come to us and they say, cool, you've got models, this is awesome, the data's messy, we get it, AI, ML, this is all fantastic, but we actually don't know how to do this. Um, we don't know how to build companies, we don't know how to scale, we can't hire data scientists. I mean, I, I came from one of the biggest utility companies in the United States, and their first question was, there's no way we hire 15 data scientists in nine months. Not happening. How do we do this? Especially because we're a utility, right? We're not exactly sexy. Um, so the, you know, the way I like to explain this to clients is th they are on the left, right? Um, so I, I, I take this back to kind of a, a soccer game where you're the coach of that team that always just makes it to the playoffs and just misses, right? You're always there, you're just kind of there, you're just kind of making it, but you miss. And you don't know why, you're ask, always asking the questions. And then the companies that have really kind of won and scaled are the you know, successful undefeated teams that always seem to kind of make it to the playoffs. Um, and, uh, and no one really knows why they kind of have the golden touch. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, the right kicker, maybe it's the right goalie, no one really knows, right? And if you look at these questions, uh, you can basically take them to any company that's trying to figure out what's wrong and why didn't things scale the way that they did. And, and what, how do we get our companies and our clients um, to get them to the step where they're always undefeated, no matter what, especially in some of the world's toughest industries to do that in right now, manufacturing, utilities, uh, reg uh, regulation is going to kick up with banks in the EU right now. Um, we've literally had five clients pull everything off of the cloud in the past five months. They've literally gone in reverse uh, due to GDPR. So yeah, it's not, not exactly the simplest, uh, simplest issue to tackle. And so um, I'm going to quickly touch upon, my, my talk will be fairly quick, I want to leave it for Q&A, but I'll, f I'll quickly touch upon a model that I, I use frequently, uh, and it's called the DIP model. And it's design, innovation, and people. And what we try to explain to our clients is that a lot of times you focus on just getting the model right, coding everything correctly, getting the data right, then hiring, oh, then maybe add a UI, we need to make it fancy. Everything is very waterfall and stage-gated, rather than at the very beginning looking at everything as a three-tiered approach, which is design, strategic, visual, and organizational. Strategically, very commonly, what are you doing two years from now, five years from now, everybody knows that. Um, visually, how are you actually taking the models you run, and this is for the practitioners in the room as well, right? But how are you doing that, and how are you making that actionable in the UI? And that doesn't mean making it super fancy. I have a UI to show you guys um, that I'll need to take the video off for, by the way, it's private. Um, that actually explains this, right? So how do you actually do something so that an executive in one button knows what's going on? That doesn't mean making something just super fancy, right? Um, and organizationally, do you create a, a center of excellence? Do you build the data science inside of the core of the company? How do you do that? Do you blend the two? Those kinds of questions. On the innovation side, it's not just about getting good engineers, right? But how do you ideate? How do you have R&D? Well, you're not typically an R&D organization. And then pure engineering, right? Uh, people, talent life cycle management, not retaining, uh, no, I'm sorry, not hiring, but retaining and also managing the life cycle of that technical uh, hire, whether it be a data scientist or an engineer. So a lot of the questions I get, uh, at McKinsey I hired over 70 engineers, at BCG I'm well up to uh, three acquisitions and four organic hires right now, up to 20 people in six months, right? So how do you hire that quickly? How do you get people in? You explain to them what their career is going to look like in a non-technical company because it's not straightforward and that's always the question, right? What, how, you have no VP of engineering title. 
you have a partner title. Am I ever going to be partner? Because don't tell me I am. That's <laughs> that's a bit of a you know that's that's a bit of a fool story, right? So. Uh, we have to explain how they're going to make it to a certain track, how they're going to be visible, how they're going to speak at conferences, um, how they can win patent speed being with us. Right? We have three engineers that are triple patented right now. So how, how do we get to that kind of space um, in a non-technical place, and how do we keep them so that when they say, wow, I came to BCG and they let me actually apply and build a patent using a tech that I built on a client, using a model that I built on a client, right? So one of our senior data scientists has a new next product to buy model called Crystal that's been patented. That creates a trust and a loyalty that when Google calls him, he might think twice. <laughs> might, he might. That, that's all I ask for, the might, right? That, that like inkling of like, oh, maybe I kind of like it here. Uh, but if I can get him even for four years, I'm golden, because that's our patent, by the way. It's not just his. Um, so, so the key, the key factors, um, and you guys obviously know uh, HR and Netflix, um, they've done a lot in this space, so I did quote them one, once here, so I, I put the citation on the bottom to be, to be fair. Uh, strategically, right, always put the user in the driver's seat. Visually, um, the user should spend less time considering and more time choosing, right? So the, when you're writing a model, when you're building a UI, when you're creating an analytic solution, Always have the user in mind and say, what is the least amount of time that user needs to make a decision about what I want them to decide on? Organizationally, right, highly aligned and loosely coupled. I mean, this is just, we're all fairly technical in the room, yet, and, and we get microservices, yet we don't apply it to people. But it's, it's the same thing, right? You can keep them loosely coupled. You don't have to put everyone in the same org, but they should actually understand what each of them are, are doing at some point in time. Innovation, um, I think I'll make this analogy again, right? So there's zero solution for timesheets, and it pisses me off. I have to fill out a timesheet every day. It's very annoying. It's very manual. And yet no company that I've seen out there has actually taken that innovative uh, you know, mind of let's build inside and then kind of sell the product outward to solve the timesheet problem. It should be fairly automated. There should be AI to know when I log onto my computer, when I log out, and every week I should know you know, hi Andrea, this is what you, we think your timesheet is, is, approve or don't approve. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet because everyone's like, yeah, there are timesheets, who cares? Um, it could actually be a fairly lucrative product because think about every single company right now that's a Fortune 100 that uses timesheets. So um, it's a startup idea. But so that's, that's the concept, right? What issues do you have internally first? Solve for that instead of continuing to think about what the market might want, especially because it's so volatile and moves so quickly. Um, allow time for non-business critical product creation. Yeah, this is, you know, very typical. Google Fridays no longer has Google Fridays, right? We say we're going to have BCG Fridays. We really can't because half the time our, our consultants are working, our engineers are coding. But what are some other creative ways you can find for people to actually ideate on the side? One of the ways we do it is by um, acknowledging and awarding if you get a patent or write a paper. And we give something called magic time to, to do things like that, but it's a percentage every week, so it's a very small number. Incentivized authorship, I, I spoke about that. Uh, people, right, so why do the employees want to work for you? I think a lot of the time we spend about seven hours of, in interviewing on the technical aspect, on what all those, you know, are they capable? Most of the times they are, but why do they want to work for that company and not just reading off the website? But do they know something about you, the hiring manager? Do they know something about the practitioners? Why is it that they want to work for you now and perhaps a couple of years from now is very important. And this one, I think, has really helped me in hiring my team, explaining to them what their contribution is actually going to do. Is the product going to make money? Is their code going to do something that makes money? What are they doing to our clients? How are they helping our clients? A lot of times we don't bring our team of 40 people that's actually managing the client on site. So they feel far removed. They feel back office. Um, so it's important for us to help them understand this is actually what you're bringing to the client uh, and, and introducing it that way. And, and that, that helps on the people side. Um, and you know we're a, we're a pro sports team and not a kids recreational league. I think it's very important to let people understand what you do is is critical and it's very important. And you're not just kind of haphazard, haphazardly hiring. And to actually have that culture every every single day. So um, a few last topics that I speak to with clients as well, and we we actually spend some time going through each of these are. 
do you actually need to change your company's mission? Obviously, this is a CEO question, right? A C-level or a board question, but has something actually changed or been triggered that where you actually need to change your mission? And I think, I believe Facebook has done this right now. Um, many companies have changed the way they do business. They look completely different, but their mission has stayed the same. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good for the, for the company. Um, who are the implementers and the doers in my organization? and How are they affected by a shift of a more digital way of working? So a lot of times you get new data scientists, you get a new analytics team, you get new practitioners, you throw them in a room and you're like, this is fantastic. Now everyone go do some work and you don't realize there's actually practitioners that have been doing some level of that work in your organization for the past 15 years. Right, so I always make this uh, analogy, right, but if you need Scala engineers and you have Java engineers doing some back office work, they're gonna learn Scala because it's Java based, right? But this is the kind of thinking that we have to bring to the higher level, uh, the higher level community in a business because they don't know that Scala is based on Java, right? These are technical things that they're just not aware of. Um, and doing that actually means they'll probably need to hire a quarter of the people that they needed to hire before. How early are you in your analytics journey and are you thinking about the, the factors in, in the model? So a lot of times we find people you know, halfway at, in, in the journey, middle, at the beginning, et cetera. We always ask them to backtrack a little bit and think, and think from the top. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and always consider your internal and external users, right? I spoke about this before, but I mean, it's really, really important. We're doing this right now. We have an MVP, we have a solution, we have a product. No one really knows about it, right? Because all of our data scientists, we have 600 of them, are testing it and breaking it and fixing it and breaking it and fixing it until we release it to the market. So Gamma is the name of the practice or of the platform you're building for? I think Sylvain will forgive me. The name of the platform is Source. And um, when you and I chatted last week, it was very interesting this question of the, of the stack. Yeah. Can you go through that? That's probably super interesting for people that care about the technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, uh, our stack is completely platform agnostic, so everything is based on Terraform scripts from the ground up, and we're a big fan of Hashi, HashiCorp, shout out. So we also use Vault to manage all of our keys and to manage our encryption system, um, and of course GitHub for our code base. As we, as we scale up, we have Kubernetes containers. Um, we have a managed Kubernetes. At the moment, to be fair, we're doing a, just so that you guys know, because if you're in this journey, we're doing a Docker Swarm to Kubernetes migration because Docker Swarm was easier to, to stand up very quickly and Amazon EKS was not available yet. Um, and then we spin, up those, we spin up those containers and at the user interface level, you have what looks like a Jupyter notebook. It's our proprietary notebook. Um, and that runs containers with analytics packages underneath the hood for our data scientists. Then we have a set of data services. The set of data services are completely, they're also proprietary and they are, imagine you have the opportunity to know every data problem across all industries and all domains, right? That's what a consulting company has. Now take that and take a consultant every day writing one ETL job based on that problem Think about being able to mash all of that together and create a library that then is essentially every ETL job against a set of data, and you can see what kind of sticks, right? Um, it's what some companies have done with a lot of GitHub models and thrown them together to see what sticks. So that's what's in the works for one of our, one of our data libraries. Um, I can't be more specific than that. And then further up the stack, we have API and visualization layers. Our visualization layer is, pu is pure React. So that, um, that design gets written down into React. That is also uh, open for our clients. So anything we do gets their branding and their coloring on it. Um, it's, it's all branded as, as them, and our systems get implemented in their in environment. So it basically looks like it's a platform that they built for themselves. And then we have an API library as well that's um, just different ways to expose our services. Uh, one of the neat things we're working on that unfortunately SageMaker didn't beat us to it just yet, but we're getting there, um, is it, we are trying to, to determine, right, if, if you have an analytics problem and you're coding, right, knowing automatically which infrastructure you need based on that model, its parameters, its dimensions, and the data you're using. Now the problem space is fairly infinite because if you think about all the analytics models and the parameters that model may have and then you take in the variability of what that data scientist may be choosing to do, 
you know, automatically determining that uh, is, is quite hard. And so we have the luxury of being able to have a feedback loop with our data scientists um, every day to actually start creating a feasible problem sp space and solve that. Um, and we're partnering with a few companies to work on that as well. Uh, so yeah, that's the overall stack and system. <laughs> so in this journey, kind of go from having a uh, six week engagement or a three month engagement trying to solve your code base with the client, is the attempt to get a perpetual revenue stream from them so that you have it and are you offering this as a SaaS because you just said that on your visualization or on your entire tech stack you have their branding. So it's almost like it sounds like trying to make a product with a SaaS product which is just custom made for them. And it sounds very them. complicated, right? <laughs> no, 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 yeah. complicated. All I'm saying is that the shift where we are remote to the shift to this part? So I, overall, um, you know, I obviously, Rich Lester speaks for BCG, right? But so, so overall, as a practitioner, as a consultant, and as a CTO for Gamma, we don't have a yes or no answer to whether we're going to go fully SaaS or being able to offer anything. What we do offer our clients is custom tailored environments where then they can run them on their own. So we are not Infosys, right? We're not Capgemini. We're not in that space to become long-term systems integrations partners. Uh, what we want to ensure is that then they get a platform that then they can run um, as, their, as basically their own. Um, and that customization is what makes the engineering of this quite difficult. Wonderful. All right. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, of course.